fly by seeing all your folks grow and climb because yeah you lift them up i got those thorns and those bitter seeds but i always share the sweetest part of me because yeah I'm not equipped to judge And every day I keep joy in my walk Love in my talk Peace in my house I keep joy in my walk Love in my talk Peace in my house You're welcome to my house You're welcome to my house You're welcome to my house yeah. You're welcome to my house, you're welcome to my house, you're welcome to my house, yeah. If I've been severed from the family tree, cause there's a nitsy bitsy friend in me that says no, yeah. You can't go up. Yeah. And I've been dancing with him my whole life. Friend, I'm gonna make him mine and let's go, yeah. We'll be smiling up. And every day I get joy in my walk, love in my talk, peace in my house. I get joy in my walk, love in my talk, peace in my house. You're welcome to 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 my house. Yeah. Riding on that path to free. Come on now, you and me. All the food I have on my shelf. When I grow that joy in myself And how I love to see my friends shine Always coming with that smile And we'll be climbing up Everybody with a full cup Hey And every day I keep joy in my walk Love in my talk, peace in my house. I keep joy in my walk, love in my talk, peace in my house. You're welcome to my house. You're welcome to my house. You're welcome to my house. Yeah. You're welcome to my house. You're welcome to my house. You're welcome to my house. Yeah. You're welcome to my house. You're welcome to my house. You're welcome to my house. That's what the earth is saying. Hey. Ah, uh, yeah. That's what the earth is saying. Yeah. You're welcome to my house. You're welcome to my house. You're welcome to my house. Yeah. You're welcome to my house. You're welcome to my house. You're welcome to my hands, yeah. Cause every day it's joy, love, peace. Joy, love, peace. Sing it out there if you hear it. Come on. Joy, love, peace. Everybody sing it. Come on. Say joy, love, peace, offering to you this joy, love, peace, we're walking and talking with joy, love, peace, everybody now say joy, love, peace.
this is a little sing along right here. Even though I can't hear any of you out there singing, I hope you're bouncing around in your chair or on your feet, wherever you are. I hope you're bouncing around, swaying, feeling a good moment, a celebratory moment of right now, thinking about Mother Earth and all of us connecting. So this is a sing-along, so go ahead and copy what I sing after I sing it. Sing as loud as you can and know that your voice is good no matter what you think, no matter what anybody says. Singing is freedom. So it goes like this. Y'all ready? Hey. Here we go. Said I'm awake. I'm awake, I'm so awake, I'm so awake, I'm awake, I'm awake, I'm so awake, and I feel real good, I know, I know, I feel really nice in my soul. Cause I'm awake, I'm awake, my eyes are open, yeah, I'm awake, my eyes are open, and it's a nice day, I hope you have a nice day, you have a nice day, it's a nice day, it's a nice day. I hope you have a nice day. Say, what a nice day. Such a nice day. What a nice day. Such a nice day. Everybody. Say, what a nice day. Such a nice day. We celebrate the earth today. We celebrate. We celebrate every day for a nice day. It's such a nice day. What a nice day. I hope you have a nice day. It's a nice day, such a nice day, what a nice day. a new one I was trying to make up the other day about Mother Earth. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thinking about Mama. focus on mm. this 
this great big beautiful planet that we live upon blueberries and daffodils and dolphins jumping just for thrill great big trees and rivers and canyons open up your mouth and you can breathe in mama Thinking about mama Earth today Mama yeah. Earth today Thinking about mama Mother Mother Earth today, what a mighty fine thing to put your focus on. This great big beautiful planet that we live upon. Blueberries and daffodils and dolphins jumping just for thrill. Great big trees and rivers and canyons. Open up your mouth that you can breathe in. Mama. Mm -hmm. Mother today thinking about mama mother Earth, every day Luke, thank you. Luke Renault, let's give a hand to Luke. That was so beautiful. Thank you so much. Woohoo! <laughs> what a beautiful planet we live on. Thank you for capturing that. Thank you. I, um, hi, everybody. I'm Jasmine Minbashian. I am the director of Meadow Valley Citizens Council. And uh, we're coming, we're broadcasting to you from rural north central Washington in the beautiful Metau Valley. For those of you who have not been to the Metau, it is a glorious place. It is a beautiful rugged mountain landscape with on the flanks of the North Cascades with an incredible river running through it all. And we are just so excited to be here with you today. Thank you for joining us. Um, I, before we get started, I would like to introduce um, our co-host tonight, Amanda Jackson Mott with Metau Arts. Amanda, there you are in your beautiful Aspen Grove. Yeah, thank you so much. It is such a pleasure to be here to be with all of you and with the Metau Valley Citizens Council. Um, I'm Amanda Jackson Mott. I'm the director of Metau Arts Alliance. We're a nonprofit based in Trist, Washington, right here in the heart of the Metau Valley. Um, and we're 37 years old. Um, I just welcome all of you into our virtual space in a celebration of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Thank you all so much for making time. Um, a special thank you to Luke Renow of Luke and the Lovingtons. Uh, the music was the perfect way to start us off tonight. Um, and lucky us, we'll get to hear from him a little bit later in the event. Great. Um, thank you, Amanda. So this is funny and awkward for all of us. We have never done anything like this before. Um, this event was actually originally planned as a two-day 
live in-person celebration in Twisp and Winthrop with many musical performances. And uh, with the recent events, we, we scrambled and we said the show must go on. So we, we did our best to learn this new platform. Uh, we've condensed the program into an hour and a half on a Zoom webinar. So we're gonna make the best of it. Um, keep in mind that we are broadcasting you to you um, from a rural mountain town with not necessarily the highest internet speed. <laughs> so I apologize in advance if things are spotty or there's some technical issues, please be patient with us as we do this for the very first time. Um, I just wanna take a moment to just give you an idea of what to expect tonight. Um, so uh, please um, uh, make sure that you have a drink <laughs> and a snack. Mine's kind of coming in and out of the sagebrush. I've got mine right here. You're comfy, you're cozy. Um, if you're able to plug in your computer into like a, a TV with an HDMI or, or the audio into a, a larger sound system, um, that's ideal. Um, we, your video is off. Um, your, your mic is off. Everyone's automatically muted. So you don't have to worry about Zoom bombing us, um, except if you're a panelist, <laughs> Michael Gerard. <laughs> um, and um, you'll be able to ask questions for the panels that we have later on in the program. And to do that, um, you can, uh, you'll see there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So you can type in your question and I'll be monitoring that during the panels. Um, the chat function is off. Um, so, so we want, aren't running a, a chat stream for this event, but the Q&A will work during the panel session. Um, I think that is, that is it. And with that, I just wanted to, to take a moment to really acknowledge that we are in a very challenging time right now, but I take deep solace in remembering that like the earth, we are incredibly resilient. The earth can adapt and so can we. So today in this, the spirit of this celebration is to take the opportunity to come together to visualize all the beautiful ways that we can continue to exist on this planet together with the Meadow Valley Citizens Council and Meadow Arts and the many incredible organizations in this valley, we wanna connect, we wanna really deepen our connection with nature and, and feel inspired to take action for the planet. Um, so that, that's what the spirit of this event is all about. I'd also like to take a moment to really dedicate this celebration to someone that was very important in the Metau, our own Mary Cassell, a beloved naturalist who recently passed away. She touched the lives of many, many in this valley with her deep, deep passion for nature. It was incredibly infectious, the right kind of infectious. So let's carry her passion forward tonight in our celebration and honor and defend our earth. I've also like to acknowledge a deep, uh, a very close personal friend of mine who's also struggling, um, uh, Floyd Rogers, who's been a passionate advocate for wildlife and for our earth. I wanna give a shout out to Floyd, we're, we're with you right now. So this celebration is dedicated to all you passionate, tireless advocates. Thank you for being here. Great. Thank you for that, Jasmine. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here this evening. Um, through my role with Meadow Arts Alliance, I've been able to see how the arts can truly affect and play a powerful role in connecting with individuals and communities. Now, we work across Okanagan County, and one of the most beautiful things we get to see through the arts is our work with students and how students can reflect on what they've learned and how they feel through the arts. Um, the arts has played a vital role in impacting critical movements 
over centuries now. And of course, this includes the very important environmental movement that we're all here to celebrate today over the last 50 years. Um, during these uncertain times that we're all feeling, the arts can also provide a way for reflection and a way for expression. The arts are a way for us all to capture these intense and very real feelings that we're all experiencing right now. And whether it be through music and song, through poetry, through painting, photography, through dance, the arts are powerful. And I strongly believe that it's the creative solutions that come from all of you that will guide us successfully into the future. And so now I get to kick us off by inviting our first speaker, who is no other than herself, Mother Nature, in Conservation International's award-winning video. Enjoy. Some call me nature. Others call me Mother Nature. I've been here for over four and a half billion years. 22,500 times longer than you. I don't really need people, but people need me. Yes, your future depends on me. When I thrive, you thrive. When I falter, you falter. Or worse. But I've been here for eons. I have fed species greater than you, and I have starved species greater than you. My oceans. My soil. My flowing streams, my forests. They all can take you or leave you. How you choose to live each day, whether you regard or disregard me, doesn't really matter to me. One way or the other. Your actions will determine your fate, not mine. I am nature. I will go on. I am prepared to evolve. Are you? Now we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that the valley that many of us call home is sacred ground. The ancestral lands of the Metha peoples. The Metha peoples are a constituent tribe of the Colville Confederated Tribes who have lived in what is now called the Metha River, the Metha River Valley from time immemorial. Other indigenous peoples, including the Yakima Nation, also have deep connections to these lands and these waters. We offer our deepest respect and gratitude for our indigenous friends who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. And in that spirit, we welcome and invite Mark Miller, a Metha tribal descendant, to provide opening remarks. Welcome, Mark. Welcome to Earth Day 2020. I'm Mark Miller. I'm American Indian. I live in North Central Washington State. My mother was a uh, Annie at in Lakes bands. My father was a Wenatchee in Madhau bands. My family lives on ancestral lands at the mouth of the Madhau River. Uh, land used by our family for probably in excess of 10,000 years. 
As a 12 year old, my grandfather charged me with the protection of this valley and our culture. Learning to do that over time and with proper education, I came across several people that helped me stay that course. My big concern was in the mid seventies while I was attending college, I took a geography class and that geography class had models set up in the late sixties. The models talked about pollution, air, water, the land, overpopulation, food shortages, all these things were projected towards the year 2000 to be in dire straits for this world. The models were so bleak that I actually got to the point I didn't want to go to class anymore. I didn't want to research that. I didn't want to write papers. Luckily, by 2000, those models were inaccurate. They changed. So. It makes me stop and ponder what has changed. What did we do? One of those things I believe is, you know, as a community, a society, we launched Earth Day in 1970, this being its 50th anniversary. So 50 years ago, mankind, no, not mankind, world kind, a world movement to change and stop what we were doing to the earth. Hence the founding and launching of Earth Day. It made us stop and assess the health of the world. And I think that's what makes those model predictions for the 60s inaccurate. In thinking about this presentation, uh, a young man I mentored uh, through school and high school and medical school, him and his wife had their first child today. And saying a prayer in this valley for that little girl and their start in life. it makes you stop and ponder what really is going to happen. What's that little girl going to see in her next 50 years? We live on the mouth of the Medhow. It's a unique environment, water, plants, animals, the land, the minerals, the people, they all have an interaction. We all influence one another. The water influences the people, the land influences people. It's, they're all integrated systems. It's not just people. We have to learn to, to interact with all the other parts of this environment. So what can we do? We have changed things. We've made things better. We have made things worse. We've tried to mitigate problems that we've created. Uh, we're trying to do things to help sustain this valley, this worldwide effort needs to continue. We need to change the pollution, the water, the land. We need to educate people. We actually need to just step up and have some action. And that's really, I think, a big part of this message. We know about all these things, but we need to just step forward and act. We can protect these things. We can change the things that we've done wrong. We can try to mitigate those things. Everybody can contribute a small amount, a large amount, you could dedicate your life to it. There's always going to be some effort that needs to happen because we've changed the world too much already. 
An Indian philosophical concept is that you need to take care of your space, not for you, but for your next seven generations. Let's think about that in the future. In closing, I want you to get involved. There's a newborn girl that came into this world today. I want a world that little girl can be proud of, that she can love, that she can change, that she can protect, so that she might protect and make this a better world for her next seven generations. Thank you. Have a great Earth Day. Thank you so much. That was an amazing, profound video from Mark Miller. Uh, words to live by, for sure. I, um, I can't think of anyone when, that embodies that spirit of acting um, in the spirit of several generations than when I think of Dennis Hayes, who 50 years ago, it's hard to believe 50 years have gone by, but 50 years ago took charge of a vision to create and help organize the very first Earth Day. And he embodies that spirit of the difference that one person with a vision can make in our life and on our planet. Look at all that's been accomplished from that very first day 50 years ago um, and where we are today and all the environmental laws that were passed because of that one action, because one person who cared took that on and became the principal national organizer of Earth Day. And he took, in 1990, he took that event worldwide. And now Earth Day is one of the most widely observed secular holidays in the world. Dennis went on uh, to be the board chair of the International Earth Day Network and most recently, he's still, he's still at it. He's been busy gearing up for the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And given what a busy man he is, especially right now, we were very honored and humbled that he took the time to meet with a couple of high school students from our own valley to really discuss um, the lessons learned from his experience and to really engage these young people in their vision for the future. So we're really excited tonight to share with you the video of that interview with the first Earth Day organizer, Dennis Hayes, and two wonderful high school students from our valley, um, Maisie Shaw and Rivers Lehman. Enjoy. <laughs> My name is Maisie Shaw. I'm 15 years old. I go to Libertyville High School and I'm very passionate about climate change because it has affected me very directly through wildfire, wildfires and air quality in my hometown. Uh -huh. And your hometown is? Uh, Twisp, Washington. In Twisp. Yeah. What a great town. Yeah, it's a really beautiful place. Yeah. Um, my name is Rivers Lehman. I am a senior at the Independent Learning Center in Twist, Washington. I did want to talk about um, when you founded Earth Day. I think um, I don't know too much about that and how that all started, um, how you got there. I would just love to know about that. Like, like so many things in life, my engagement with what became Earth Day was somewhat random. 
um, during that hitchhiking trip throughout Africa, I, I, I had an epiphany one night. I, I was out looking for something that made sense for me, a, a set of values to live by, something that uh, would indicate um, a world that I would like to devote my life to building. And it, it, it all boiled down to what we would today call human ecology, industrial ecology, urban ecology. We didn't have that vocabulary then, but I came back uh, to the United States to go back to my senior year at university then, and with, with that as my goal. When I was in graduate school, there was a senator who, after flying over the uh, Santa Barbara oil spill, uh, proposed that there be an environmental teaching on college campuses. And I had just moved from the West Coast to the East Coast. I didn't really know many people in my new school. And uh, I hadn't heard anything about this teaching there. Uh, and so I, I, with the audacity of youth, flew down to Washington and got a 15-minute courtesy meeting with the senator to volunteer to organize uh, this event at Harvard. And it turned out he didn't have anybody organizing Harvard or Cambridge or Boston or Massachusetts. I mean, there wasn't really anybody doing anything. He'd, he'd given this as a speech saying it's something that ought to happen. So I went back with the charter to organize Boston. And uh, a few days later, got a call from his chief of staff saying, would you consider dropping out and coming down to organize the United States? So that, that was a fairly rapid progression of jobs in a, in a one week period. And then tragically, fairly soon, it became clear that it was impossible. There was just no interest on this in college campuses. Mm -hmm. There was a war going on in Southeast Asia. The civil rights movement was getting very heated. We'd had the assassination of Martin Luther King, the assassination of Robert Kennedy. Um, and the environment wasn't, at that point, a student issue. But it turned out that there were a great many people, mostly young women between the ages of maybe 25 and 35, typically college educated, typically with a couple of children at home, typically in a one wage earner family with some time on their hands. And uh, they wrote in uh, and sort of indicated their interest. So we wrote back to them, sent out some organizers. It turned out few of them had ever organized anything before, but we had a lot of talent on our staff that could stir things up. And they were really bright, deeply committed, passionate about these issues. And uh, at that point, we took out a full page ad in the New York Times, formally changed the name from environmental teaching, rechristened it Earth Day, took it off of college campuses, out, out into the communities. It started picking up steam, at which point the college kids started bounding into it. And, and it turned out to be, at that time, the largest event that had ever been organized in the United States. Uh, we had one out of 10 Americans participating in the first Earth Day. Wow, wow, that's incredible. Um, on that note, um, we have both noticed in political debates and even in our schools that it is kind of an issue trying to talk to people um, when they have different views or kind of don't agree with this or don't understand it? And how have you personally kind of overcome that to be able to talk to someone and just ex like listen to them instead of it be more of an argument? It's hard. It's particularly hard when they're screaming at you. <laughs> uh, the, I, I don't know that there's any great secret that I have to reveal, and I, I don't want to pretend that I've been hugely successful there. Somebody once said that um, if somebody's paycheck depends upon them believing something, it's very difficult to persuade them not to believe it. And there are a lot of people that are being paid to hold their positions, to lobby on behalf of the fossil fuel industry, or lobby on behalf of their jobs. Um, I, I think the most important part of what you said is, is the heart of those efforts to be successful in setting up a dialogue, and that's you don't talk and then wait and then talk. You talk and then listen and then respond. You have a, a genuine conversation. You let them know that you value their opinion. You try to, there, there's a, there was a, when I was younger, a famous book then that came out of Harvard called Getting to Yes. And it said you can never win a debate with somebody on the other side if you're arguing 
the points that they bring up. What you want to do is to take yourself one step back from that and say, what are the principles that we're trying to achieve? What would be a good outcome? And then you know, we, we can deal with the details later, but once you've established what, what those generalized shared values are, at, at that point you've got a basis to go forward, maybe, to, to make some progress. Um, so I'm in civics this year as a sophomore, and I'm doing my civics action project on educating my community on a few climate bills that are important to me, um, one being the clean fuel standard, mm -hmm. um, the community solar bill, mm -hmm. um, sustainable farms and fields bills. Um, what do you think would be the best way to get my point across and to educate my community? Hmm. Um, boy, one is to have a, a, a clear understanding of what the goals are of all of those bills, mm -hmm. to listen to the objections to them, many of which are articulated by the legislators on the other side of the issue, and try to figure out what your strongest response is to that, because you're going to be encountering those objections when mm -hmm. you're talking to the community and how to be thinking about it ahead of time. Well, the clean fuels legislation is particularly strange because there appears to be one senator who's blocking it, he chairs the relevant committee and has got the capacity to keep it bottled up in committee. And, um, I'm, I'm not sure that he's exchangeable <laughs> on this, so there's a lot of pressure that's starting to get brought to bear on him. He's even a member of the governor's own political party, but he just doesn't support this. Um, but the most important thing is, see, what are the advantages of this legislation? What are the disadvantages? And do you really believe that those modest disadvantages uh, are uh, sufficient to cause you to oppose it? I mean, ev everything that is out there is, is a compromise. The first piece of major federal legislation I was involved with was the Clean Air Act. Uh, it's now viewed as revolutionary. There have been certainly well over $10 trillion spent differently as by, by the public sector and the private sector as a result of that legislation. And it, because it all went through a benefit-cost analysis, it was good to have spent that money. We are better off. Uh, the benefits far outweighed the costs of it. Uh, so, sounds like an incredible triumph. At the time, it was considered this deeply compromised piece of legislation. Uh, you know, what, what, what we wanted to do, the model bill was to outlaw the internal combustion engine in 10 years. Uh, that means there would not have been any cars using gasoline by 19, probably by about 1985. That would have dramatically accelerated the growth of electric automobiles. It would have done all kinds of things. It was just not possible. You, there, there was no way to summon the votes to pass something like that. So we, we passed the strongest thing we could, recognizing that it was not unflawed. And today it looks like it was just an incredible triumph. At the time, it was the best we could do. And not only best we could do, it had sufficient support that, although it was opposed by the oil industry, the gas industry, the coal industry, the electric utility industry, the automobile industry, the steel industry. If you had power, you opposed this piece of legislation. Uh, and it passed the Senate unanimously on a voice vote, and it passed the House of Representatives with just one dissenting vote, largely because we had 20 million Americans standing up demanding it on Earth Day. Yes, I, I, I'd like to know your vision of the world 10 years from now if you are spectacularly successful. Um, if I were spectacularly successful, I would be living somewhere in nature and pretty much trying as hard as I could to not contribute to consumerism or the industrialization of the earth and I would be trying to have all green energy, doing everything I can to just conserve what I can. Mm -hmm. um, that's what being spectacularly successful would mean to me. What about you? Um, for me, uh, 
you know, in 10 years, I think that by then I'll be thinking about kids and what my children's future is going to look like. And um, as far as that goes, I just hope that it's green for them um, and not what we're hoping that's going to happen. Um, I think just as well as Maisie was saying, in nature and taking care of it and knowing that, like you were saying, that we aren't at the top of the food chain and um, respecting that um, and hopefully keeping that vision in the next 10 to 20 years. I think a lot of humans have an idea that we are above everything else and I think that that's not the case. I think that there is wildlife and Mother Nature. It's all above us and it all has so much power. But right now, we just have the technology and that's what's giving us power. And it's not that we are stronger or better than nature. It's that we just have the technology which could be used in a really positive way, and yeah. hopefully it will be. <laughs> so we have an international issue. We don't have any strong international bodies to set rules and regulations and laws, and no way to enforce them across borders if we did. We have things happening at, in nations, the United States for one, that has become increasingly nationalist. But the same thing has happened in China, in India, in Japan, in the Philippines, in Turkey, in Syria. Um, so that level of solution is, is getting really difficult at the moment to achieve. And so what's happening is that the great progress is happening locally. Uh, mayors are often the greatest climate leaders at every conference you go to. And they're not just the mayors of the major cities, though a lot of attention goes to the Copenhagens and the Freiburgs, Torontos. Uh, but but of communities uh, like TWISP, where you, you're going to, from the bottom up, build this thing. Because although there's a great many things that uh, the federal government could do that would make it much easier, there's nothing that the federal government can do that can stop you from building a, a carbon neutral community in TWISP. I, we just wanted to thank you for doing whatever you can to conserve our future and our earth. And sharing your story with us. Yeah. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. I, mean, yeah. I get enormously inspired when I find people your age who are out there committed to this. When, mm -hmm. when I was young, um, we, we spoke of um, movements for change, always starting with young people. The civil rights movement was young people. The anti-war movement was young people. Environmental movement, once it got itself a little bit of momentum, was dominated by relatively young people. But young people then meant 23, 24, 25. Today on climate, we find it 13, 15, 18 years old. You're, you're, you're seizing this issue and not waiting until you become voters, not waiting until you become shareholders, not waiting until you become dominant consumers. You're, you're seizing your future today, and, and that's an inspiration certainly to me, and I'm, I'm sure mm -hmm. to your parents as well. Mm -hmm. so, thank you. Yeah. Wow. So the voices of those young people are the ones we really need to be listening to right now. The future is theirs. And we, um, as their elders and an older generation, need to be helping them create that future. And so in that spirit, we, um, there is a Liberty Bell High School Climate Action Group. And we asked them to share with us what their visions for the future are and so they, they recorded little clips for us and shared it with their friends and recruited their friends to chime in. So this next section, we're gonna ask more young people what their vision for their future are. And I hope you find it as inspiring as I 
I have. Hi, I'm Simone Van Murder. I'm in 11th grade at Liberty Bell High School. And I would like the future of the environment to be as natural as it can be. I don't think that human interference is what it needs to be in the future. I think that if it were to be reverted to what it was before humans intervened, that would be the most optimistic and idealistic outcome. Um, yeah, thanks for your time. In the future, I would love to see the environment healthy with distinct seasons, diversity of species, and stable ecosystems. Um, in the future, I want our environment to be a healthy ecosystem with clean water and pure air and fertile soil and regulated climate um, and native species of both plants and animals and kind of a balanced living between all the species on I'm it. Travis and I hope the future environment is one that encourages a lot of snow. I hope to see a future where the health of our planet is not a partisan issue but instead something that everyone enthusiastically supports regardless of their party affiliation. For the environment's future I would like there to be more snowpack and have there be a higher water flow for the lakes and rivers and have there be less or no light pollution. My overarching hope for the future of the environment is that generations to come are able to experience and appreciate the incredible and unmarred natural areas and beauty that our world contains, something which living in this valley I've been so lucky to experience. And I hope that this broader insight will continue to foster its value um, and a desire among all people everywhere to maintain and take care of our in Earth. In the future, I would like to see the environment be taken care of more diligently by those in power. I would like corporations to be held responsible for the destruction that they do of the environment. I would like the Green New Deal to be passed, and I would like Native Americans to be given reparations for their land. In the valley, I would like to see less fires, and I would like the future generations in the valley to be able to experience the same wonderful natural spaces that I get to experience. In the future, I would like to see fewer fires in the valley, uh, more distinct seasons, and more snowfall. In the future, I would love to see a decline in the summer fires and for the current burn areas to be able to regrow into the robust greenery that they were before. In the future, I would like the Green New Deal to be passed and for more snowfall in the winter. I would also like less fires in the summer and for corporations to be held responsible for all the emissions they put out. I want to help fight for a future where we can use cleaner and more sustainable sources of energy to lower our emissions of greenhouse gases and to help reduce the pollution of air, water, and soil in the Mahal Valley and beyond. My future environment would be based around sustainable agriculture and small-scale homesteading, specifically perennial agriculture, food forests, and natural systems. I believe that we could gain community independence and lose our dependence upon fossil fuels. I think that our future depends on us being self-sufficient. These young people have it figured out. <laughs> they know the way forward and we need to follow them. And in that spirit, um, we're so excited tonight to have one of our leading youth climate activists joining us tonight for a live interview, Shutezkat Martinez. Um, I'm going to introduce him in a little bit. But before that, I wanted to bring on um, the last young woman you saw on that video, Ari Sprower. Come on, come on forward, Ari. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Ari. Hi. She is a bright, very intelligent, smart, passionate uh, defender of the earth. She has a lot of amazing ideas and creativity and she's here in the valley organizing and trying working hard to create a future that we all can can live in and when i was thinking about uh this interview with shutezkat martinez i thought 
who, who's really the best person to interview Tescott? And immediately I thought of Ari, uh, because she is a, a young activist who's um, fighting for a better future. And it was so important for me to see her, just to, to empower her and see that, com that conversation between another really in, in inspiring and incredible youth activist. Um, talking about our future and, and how we were gonna navigate the challenges ahead. So Ari, thank you for <laughs> agreeing to do this. Thank you, Jasmine. I feel so honored to be able to do this today. Awesome. Um, so Shutezka Martinez, we are so blessed and fortunate to have, to have him with us today. Um, he is a hip hop artist, he's an activist, he's, an amazing human being. He is the youth director for Earth Guardians. He was born in Colorado, um, but raised in the traditions of his indigenous Mexican heritage. And he's um, got an incredible voice for our planet. He's um, just 19 years old, I think the same age as you, Ari. Um, and he's one of 21 young people that's suing the US government in a famous court case to secure the constitutional right to life and liberty by demanding action on climate change and a reduction in fossil fuel use. He is, was recently named in Time Magazine's uh, Next 100 as a rising star helping shape our future. And he's been on tons of talk shows. I won't name them all, but he's been with Van Jones and Farrell Williams on the Trevor Noah uh, Daily Show with Trevor Noah, Real Time with Bill Maher. He's been featured in tons of major news and media outlets, PBS, Showtime, National Geographic, the list goes on. Um, he's got an incredible talent for connecting people uh, through popular culture and sharing a very important message um, from his indigenous roots um, to help, help protect our planet. Um, if you're not familiar with Shutezkot and his work, I want to share with you a short video clip that really shows truly um, what a talent this young man is. So let's see that video clip. And this is the year that we take back the power with our music, with our voice, with our passion for every generation to follow. I really got involved in environmental activism when I was six years old. I just said a prayer on my native language. I was giving thanks to all the elements, the water, the fire, the earth, the air. You're 16. Mm -hmm. I, you may be the youngest person on our show. My name is Shuta Scott. I'm 18 years old. I'm a climate activist and a hip-hop artist using my music and my voice to inspire young people across the planet to engage in creating a positive difference in the world. We are at a tipping point right now where we will either be remembered as a generation that destroyed the planet, as a generation that put profits before future, or as a generation that united to address the greatest issue of our time. Our generation is the least racist, the most educated, the most diverse, and the best equipped to handle our climate crisis. Young people and students need to be involved, not only because this is our future, because we are here now and we hold power today. And having that dialogue within our classrooms and asking young people, how do you feel about this? How does climate change affect you? And if it doesn't affect you, what is your responsibility in the sense of it affecting the greater world around you? These kind of different questions need to be asked and young people's voices need to be heard so that we can feel an investment and a connection to this crisis. And this is our movement. This is your movement and you have a part to play. So play that role. Please join our campaign and help us get our artwork into 20,000 schools. Wow. So without further ado, it's my great honor to introduce Chutezka Martinez. Welcome to the Metal Valley. There you are. Hello. Uh, I, you. I heard you today on the live stream on Instagram with Miley Cyrus. Yeah, that was crazy. That was awesome. That was a very, very, very inspiring conversation. That was very cool. Thank you. Yeah, really Got powerful. It. Anyway, I'm going to hand it over to you guys to have a conversation. I'm really looking forward to this. Thank you. Awesome. Appreciate it. Hi. Okay. Bye, Ari. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. I'm a little bit nervous, but I'm super ready. <laughs> I'm excited to have this conversation. And yeah, 
I've got some questions for you and it's kind of stuff that I've just been thinking a lot about and I wanted to hear um, what you have to say as such a prominent climate activist. Um, so yeah, I thought we'd just go right into it. Okay. Um, my first question is, um, often we witness that the relationship between our youth and elders in this country is broken. What are ways that we can work to build back those relationships and why do you think they're so important? Yeah, I think, um, I think most of the countries in the world that I've visited and been to have a much stronger emphasis on, on that intergenerational connection and respect than we do here yeah. in the United States. Um, from my family in Latin America and, and Mexico, um, and just understanding kind of the deep importance, the deep role that, that like that family, the familial connection is, is so critical. Um, I think for indigenous peoples, uh, so much of our practicing of cultural survival of decolonization yep. of, of resistance against oppressive systems doesn't just look like um, fighting pipelines and standing in the way of, of fossil fuel development, but it's literally like speaking to our elders and learning our language, you know, and, and so for all people, for all, you know, walks of life, all different races, all communities, um, there's an exchange of, of knowledge that happens both ways that I think is absolutely critical um, to hold space for. And I think this moment of uh, within this global pandemic, it shed the light on the fact that like our elders are like a very sacred um, group of, of, of people on this planet that are, are vulnerable to a lot of the impacts, not just of this virus, but of, um, you know, every other major disaster that is going to continue to happen that, you know, there's, there's a need to protect and defend and stand in solidarity with um, the older members of our community. And at the same time, you know, there's a lot of broken ideologies, I think, and, and, and broken ways of seeing the world that older generations hold on to. So it's, a, it's, a, I think, creating a discussion in a space where, you can go back and forth both ways. Yeah, so sort of just making sure that we make the effort to communicate and we keep reaching out is one of those important ways. A hundred percent. And being patient too. You gotta be patient because some of those conversations are really hard. Like I know a yeah. lot of my friends have grandparents who are either like hella racist or, you know, they don't believe in the climate crisis or, you know, they're, they're you know, bought into uh, like conservative media, like whatever it is. It's, so there are sure. difficult conversations, you know? Yeah, definitely. And I know I've totally experienced it and I've definitely worked um, to better my communication. But yeah, I think it's definitely like it's such an important thing that we keep connecting and we keep learning from our elders and they lived in such a different way than us when they were young. Mm. And I think we can <laughs> learn so much from that. So, yeah, um, that is a beautiful perspective. And thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. My next uh, question I have for you is, um, this is something I've been thinking about a lot, um, and I'm really interested to hear what you have to say. Um, so, in American culture, death is generally seen as a scary and negative thing. How mm. is death culture different in your traditions, and how can a new culture around death lift some of the weight and anxieties off of the youth? I've never been asked this question before. <laughs> yeah, it's kind it's, of a big uh, one. It's refreshing. It, it feels interesting to answer to at a time where there is so much unnecessary death um, happening right now, too. Right. Um, but it's, uh, you know, definitely the culture around death is, is very different um, for for the way that I was raised. I think there's a much a larger um, overall, I think, cultural emphasis on on cycles on, and on, on, on human life, on life in general being cyclical rather than it being linear. Um, yeah. We, you know, when we die, when our bodies die, like our, our spirit continues its journey um, mm -hmm. past this world. And um, my great grandma, honestly, I've, I've experienced personally very, very little death in my life. My great grandmother yeah. passed away last fall. Um, and she was like the, the, the matriarch of our family. She like held so much space, so much wisdom. And I went down to Mexico um, shortly after she passed. And there was just such a beauty and emphasis on celebration of life for her legacy, for what she carried on. I mean, she took to her final breaths, you know, she yeah. was like holding on to what she believed in and fought for. So yeah, I think overall just like, um, you know, we have a lot to celebrate wow, that is in this life. <sighs> yeah. And I, and I don't believe that death is an ending either. Um, yeah. But it's, it's something I'm continuing to, to explore, understand better. Um, and I think I've been relatively sheltered, honestly, from it too. So I think I have a lot to learn as well. Yeah, me too, for sure. But it's definitely... Every time that I learn a little bit more about death, it becomes a lot more beautiful and a lot more fascinating.
fascinating. And I think that it's important to talk about because I think it's one of those things that for me at least, like people felt, it felt uncomfortable to talk about or with other people it felt uncomfortable to talk about. Um, but like, as I've gotten older, I've really started to see like how beautiful it is to really think about it and talk about it. And just to know that we can talk about it and that it's not mm -hmm. some really negative thing. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so this is my next question. And I think this one's really important uh, to get out there. But often many of us are paralyzed in fear by the climate crisis. Um, and it can be difficult to take action or to know what to do. So in your experience, what are the best and fastest ways to get involved right now? Like, as soon as people got off this call, what is something they could do to get involved? Yeah, it's such a, it's, I've been getting that question since, you know, before I even understood. Yeah. Um, like, a, a, before I even had a critical analysis on, on what that really meant. Um, and I think in our culture, we're, we're so used to looking for the easy fix, the easy solutions. What is, what, what is a, you know, list of five things, 10 things we can do. Um, yeah. And it's really hard because, because this crisis is, is not linear. It's very systemic. Uh, I think it is, it is entrenched in so many other injustices that have, you know, paralyzed and, and, and built, you know, the wealth of this country from colonialism to capitalism and, and white supremacy and patriarchy. And, and there's layers to unpack. Um, and climate affects a lot of people really differently, you know, and like seeing the videos of some yeah. of the students earlier in this little feed, um, like for them, like the very real connection to it for them is like, you know, our homes, our valley, our snowpack, our, our, our connection to our nature. But right. I think it's, it's a different relationship for everybody. Whereas, you know, kids in like South Central LA, they're, you know, being like my friends from South Central are being diagnosed with cancer because they grew up next to, um, you know, uh, urban uh, oil fields. Like that that's, was the reality and that was their upbringing. And it's like, everybody's being impacted differently, but it is going to change the world and it's continuing to change the world. And so the, the simple steps, I think, is to uh, recognize what, what ways can you interact with, the, with, with this crisis? Um, and, and part of it is awareness and part of it is, I think, really understanding that the way each of us individually interacts with the climate crisis is one small part of a very complex system. Um, yeah. And I think the power of individual actions, the power of uh, recognizing our own impact on the environment isn't because, you know, if we uh, walk more than we, or we take public transportation more than we drive our cars, that it's gonna stop the climate crisis. Like, it's not how systemic issues work. Yeah. But the, pow but the power in it is, it, re it grounds us in this understanding that like, we are connected to everything around us. We are connected to these mountains, to these forests, to these rivers, to these oceans, to these yeah. people on the other side of the world who are experiencing this in a different way. We are all connected. Um, and the, the utilization of our voice and our power comes in many ways. So understand how you are connected to this issue and understand how you can connect to your voice. Because everybody's voice is expressed differently. Everybody's passion looks differently. Um, and so I would say like, have these conversations, break this down and, and get uncomfortable. You know, it's, it's good to get uncomfortable and it's good to be challenged. And I'm 19 years old and I'm highly young still, but I've, I've been experiencing and being in this movement for 13 years. And I'm still like right now questioning everything about my own involvement and how to do it more effectively, better, how to understand more deeply, how to be more informed, how to operate from a place of greater compassion and understanding how to humble myself. Um, this, this is a complex one. There's, there's a lot of layers yeah. to it, but I, I encourage people to find others um, in your community that you can engage in these conversations with. Mm -hmm. There is so much light. There is so much organizing. There's so much change um, at a political level, at local levels. Uh, there is so much, yeah, there's so much good that is happening in the spaces that has happened since the first Earth Day until now. Um, yeah. And beyond that, you know, and I think it's going to be a continuous exploration for all of us. Yeah, absolutely. So many layers and definitely we have power in numbers to start tackling the individual problems of where we live. And mm -hmm. I think you said that so beautifully and I'm really grateful that I got to talk to you today. I think our time is about up, but I did want to ask you if you had any extra wisdom that you would like to share with our community today. Um, yeah, now is, now would be the time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Thank you for everybody who is, um, help organize, who help put together this and hold the space. I think the fact that you guys are throwing events like this for your community is, is really powerful is that you guys are holding space like this. 
um, to have, you know, Native elders opening up the space was, is always beautiful to see. Um, yeah. And I think, under, understand also what, what this connection to your land really, really means. Um, we are at a time of unprecedented change at every level. And I think we are being called upon to do more. We are being called upon to fight harder. We are being called upon to be selfless and recognize that um, the impacts of this crisis are not going to be evenly distributed. And many people are already suffering, that this is not an issue that is far off in the future, but it is something that we are, that the global community is, is feeling right now. Um, and we'll yeah. continue to do so. And this pandemic is a, is a glimpse of a lot of uncertainty um, and of the, the true brokenness of the infrastructure within this nation to help protect the most vulnerable of us. And I think now is a time for love. Now is a time for unity. Now is a time for us to come together um, and, to, and to push and to, and to really understand that these moments of crises are where transformation emerges from. And we all have a responsibility to play our part within that. Use your voice, connect with your community, step outside of your boundaries, pop the bubble of where you grew up and go outside yeah. and talk to people who don't look like you, message people on the internet that don't like you, learn, listen, be an ally, understand more deeply what it means to be on indigenous land. It is, uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to visiting sometime, being out there. Yeah, and, absolutely. Um, thanks, thanks for opening up the space. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your presence. Absolutely, thank you for your time and thank you for joining us. Um, and I know everyone in this valley um, is going to really appreciate all of your beautiful words, so. It was so nice to speak with you, and I think we'll mm -hmm. hand it off to Jasmine. Yeah, Appreciate thank it. you, Shadescott. We're we're still aiming to uh, have uh, Shadescott come out. This we don't know a date yet, either this fall or next Earth Day. But our goal is to get Shadescott out here in person to perform, and he has actually a new album out. So if you want to check out some of his music, um, I believe yesterday or today was a, a brand new album release um voice runner music video release music video release music. but the oh, album is right. also out you're good okay. you're good Thank voice you. runners though that's that's the name look it up okay voice runners is the name as a music video release so check it out and uh i've been following his music it's it's pretty incredible and powerful just like just like he is so thank you x um all right so thank you ari um, thank you, Shutezkot. That was incredible. Um, humbled by that. I um, we're going to switch gears now. Um, we're going to take that incredible wisdom and that that important big picture thinking, and we're going to really have a look at what's happening. What is what is in play right now? What are the solutions? What are people working on to help uh, address this climate crisis? Um, address the crisis with our planet. There's some in really incredible work happening from all the way from the national level, uh, st happening at the state level, and also at the local level. So we've invited some pretty incredible people to join us and share the work that they're doing. I think you're gonna be inspired by what you hear. Um, so I'd like to invite our panelists uh, for a state of the nation discussion come on board hello 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 hi there uh oh where'd amelia go we lost amelia uh oh can you hear me oh yeah i can hear you now i just don't have your video oh but let me try and fix that okay all right we will well you get back on and i'm gonna start um with introductions so that we can get going here. So we have a pretty incredible array. I'm going to start at the, the national uh, level uh, with Michael Gerard. Thank you, Michael, for being here. Michael is the Andrew Sabine Professor of uh, Law at Columbia Law School, where he teaches courses on environmental and energy law. He founded and directs the Sabine Center for Climate Change Law, and he's practiced environmental law for three decades in New York City, and he served as the chair of the American Bar Association Section of Environment and Energy and Resources. We've invited Michael um, here to talk about the current um, state of play with environmental rollbacks. Many of the laws that were passed 
around the first Earth Day 50 years ago are under attack by the current administration. So we wanted to hear kind of what the status of that was and um, what's being done about that. Um, we also have Michael first. Hi, Michael. So we have two Michaels, which can be very confusing. So I'm going to call Michael first Michael and Michael Gerard, I'm going to call you Mike, if that's okay. <laughs> All right, awesome. Um, Michael Furs is uh, the Assistant Director at the Washington State Department of Commerce, where he heads the State Energy Office. Um, he is the lead. He is taking charge of Washington State's transition to clean energy. Thank you, Michael. That is such incredible work. I, we're so grateful for your leadership on this policy, um, helping us as a state invest in cutting edge, clean technologies, um, responding to energy emergencies, and it really expanding equitable access to, to clean energy across the state. Um, this is very, very important work. It's gonna strengthen all communities across the state, including ours here in the Met House. So we're deeply grateful for, to have you here. Um, I think we still have Amelia on the phone. So hopefully you can um, hear Amelia until we get her back on video. Um, Amelia is the program director for the Environmental Trust Department at the Colville Confederated Tribes. She's a citizen, enrolled citizen of the tribes and her heritage is Okanagan, um, Moses, Columbia, Arrow Lakes, Palouse and Chief Joseph Band of the Nez Perce. She is in charge for coordinating the planning of the department's six management areas to support, protect, and enhance subsistence uses, ecological functions, and regulatory codes of the Colville tribes. And she's also on several boards, including the Center for World Indigenous Studies, Conservation Northwest, Hearts Gathered, and the Nez Perce Wallawa Homeland Project. So we're so grateful to have Amelia with us today as well. Um, we're going to start just by uh, give every panelist is going to give a, a brief uh, five minute, five to eight minute opening statement talking about the work that they're involved in. And then after that, we're going to open it up to questions and discussion. So this is going to be your time, you folks in the audience, if, if after what you hear, uh, generate some burning questions. I'm going to be monitoring the Q&A and I will facilitate that part of the discussion. So let's start with um, Mike. Let's hear what's happening at the national level. Thank you very much, Jasmine. It's a pleasure to be with you all here uh, virtually. <clears throat> the environmental news that we've been hearing from the Trump administration is consistently bad. They're doing everything they can to roll back environmental regulations, including as recently as last night when it came out that they were trying to uh, reduce the uh, stringency of the mercury standards. Uh, but the glimmer of good news, sort of, is that they don't know what they're doing. They're very bad at rolling back regulations because they don't bother to follow the legally mandated procedures in doing that. And there are legions of environmental lawyers around the country who are poised to, to challenge every one of these rollbacks in court. And there are still federal judges who will strike down administrative actions that they think are improper. Uh, just two days ago, there were two good decisions that came down. A federal court in Montana struck down an action by the Trump administration in granting a blanket clean water waiver to lots of pipelines that had to cross streams, including the Keystone XL pipeline. Uh, the court said that the uh, Corps of Engineers had not followed the Endangered Species Act and so it nullified that blanket approval. When President Trump came in, his EPA administrator, uh, Scott Pruitt, also said that the uh, uh, scientific advisory boards shouldn't have to EPA shouldn't have any members who have received any grants from EPA. Well, most academic scientists have received grants from EPA. He kicked them all out and replaced them mostly with industry scientists. On uh, Wednesday, a federal court in New York ruled that that was arbitrary and capricious and that uh, Pruitt couldn't do that. Here are a few other examples of, of this sort of thing. Methane is one of the most potent greenhouse gases, much more powerful on a pound per pound basis than carbon dioxide. Natural gas is mostly methane. 
under the Obama administration, the Bureau of Land Management, which administers much federal land, adopted regulations uh, requiring controls on methane leakage while drilling for oil and gas on federal land. The Trump administration tried to suspend that rule to give a break to the oil and gas companies. The federal court in California rejected the suspension and said that the rule needed to stay in place because the reasons given by the administration were illegitimate and had no support in the evidence. EPA under President Obama issued another uh, rule on emissions of methane from oil and gas wells. Uh, EPA under Trump then halted the, that application of the rule. The DC Circuit Court found that this was invalid because EPA uh, first needed to go through a, a formal uh, notice and comment period, which they hadn't done. So the rule stayed in place. Hydrofluorocarbons are another powerful greenhouse gas. EPA under Obama uh, adopted a regulation uh, restricting its release. In 2015, the DC Circuit Court of Appeals in a decision written by Judge Brett Kavanaugh before he was promoted to the Supreme Court, found that part of that rule was invalid for various technical reasons that I think are dubious. The Trump administration then revoked the entirety of the rule, not uh, just the parts that the court had left alone. A week ago, the DC Circuit found that the administration had gone too far and should, ha and should not have revoked the rest of the rule uh, without going through a formal uh, notice and comment process. The Department of the Interior adopted a rule requiring that coal, oil, and gas companies fair a pay a fair price for extracting fossil fuel from federal lands and plugged a loophole that it allowed the companies to dodge royalty payments. The Trump administration revealed, uh, repealed that rule the federal court said that the administration had not given any good reason for the change in policy, and it undid the administration's actions. Um, there are uh, many other examples that I could uh, uh, get into. Um, and uh, let me just say that all these are cases that have been decided. Many other cases have ruled against Trump administration actions. There are many more of these lawsuits that are now pending. Uh, these include um, amendments by the Trump administration to regulations under the Endangered Species Act, litigation about failure to implement a rule concerning air pollution that crosses state lines, a lawsuit against the repeal of a rule on hydraulic fracturing. Um, all of these are being challenged in court. One especially important uh, rollback that's being uh, challenged in court, uh, which I think has a particularly high chance of being struck down, concerns greenhouse gas emissions from automobiles. In 2010, when the Obama administration bailed out much of the U.S. auto industry, which was in, um, in a recession, in the last great recession, an agreement was struck uh, under which fuel economy standards and greenhouse gas emission standards would be progressively tightened through 2025 with the possibility of a reevaluation in the middle. Uh, the Trump administration now says they've reevaluated the standards and they say they are too stringent, even, so, even though several of the big car manufacturers say they can live with the prior standards. Uh, the only real uh, victims of these standards are the oil companies, which would lose a lot of business if you have more efficient automobiles. The Trump administration is trying to roll that back and is also trying to take away California's ability to set its own tight standards as allowed by the Clean Air Act of 1970. Several lawsuits have already been filed. The administration's technical justification for all of this is particularly flimsy. Uh, moreover, it's unlikely that the litigation will be finished before the November election. And if Trump uh, uh, loses, the new administration in January will certainly revoke all of this. Um, last night, as I mentioned, there was a, an announcement about doing something on the way to uh, weaken the mercury standards. I think that, too, is very vulnerable. So there's no question that Trump is doing a lot of environmental damage, but that damage has been considerably moderated by the successful litigation that environmental groups and state attorneys general have been waging against these rollbacks. We're very pleased to work uh, with many of these lawyers around the country. And uh, so there is hope that the Trump administration, however long it lasts, 
won't be as bad for the environment as it is attempting to be. Thank you. Mike, that's really powerful. It's good to know that our legal system is still somewhat intact and can defend against these pretty egregious rollbacks of decades of really important work. So thank you for tracking that and um, paying close attention to how that's unfolding. I really appreciate all your good work. Um, we're gonna go next to, to the state level uh, with Michael Furs, and we're really excited to hear about what kinds of things are happening at the state level with uh, our clean energy transition? Great. Well, thank you so much for having me here. Happy Earth Day, everybody. It's really, um, it's an honor. There's a lot that's going on at the state level. And um, that might be something that folks would expect with Governor Inslee, who I think is thought of as a climate governor and an issue that he cares deeply about. Um, in the last couple of legislative sessions, we've had a change that's cracked open a broader political window that's allowed us to uh, take those climate ideas and turn them into legislation that's been able to pass. Earlier in the conversation today, there was mention of the clean fuel standard, something that has not yet passed, a uh, community solar bill. But two legislative sessions ago, we had a very big year. Uh, there were uh, bills around appliance standards, something that is regularly rolled back or attempted to roll back at the federal level. We got a new set of standards here in Washington State. We also passed a bill, first of its kind in the nation, for existing commercial buildings to achieve uh, an energy benchmark. Uh, we updated the state's greenhouse gas emission standards and also passed a bill around uh, the reduction of uh, super pollutants. The centerpiece of the legislation was what's called the Clean Energy Transformation Act which like all of these is a compromise bill that's designed to put the state on a path to 100% clean electricity by the year 2045. It's a pretty big piece of legislation and all of those have rules that are in the process of being implemented by the, the hundreds of folks who work on these energy problems uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, most of them are outside of the Department of Commerce, uh, at different state agencies, different advocacy groups and different industry participants. Tucked into the Clean Energy Transformation Act is a requirement that the Department of Commerce update the state's uh, energy strategy by uh, 2021. And so that's a process that we began in January. Uh, this is the third uh, state energy strategy of its kind. And I know what you're thinking, shouldn't we be strategic about how we approach our energy future all the time? And I think the answer to that question is yes. Uh, this is a more formal process where we're convening a group of 27 uh, stakeholders, representatives from different industries and parts of the state and different perspectives. And we're trying to figure out the ways in which we can help the state achieve its greenhouse gas emissions targets and comply with the tenets of the Clean Energy Transformation Act, which say that we'll get 100% clean electricity. Uh, the last strategy was done in 2012, and a lot has changed since then. Um, you know, we, we were able to more directly recognize the effects uh, that the existential threat that is climate change poses in Washington State. We're continuing to deal with the aging infrastructure of the grid and the need to reinvest in it in ways that will help transform our communities uh, and our, our energy infrastructure. We're dealing with natural disasters and we're dealing with cyber threats. So we've embarked on this process and we have brought in a range of technical consultants that are gonna help us model the current situation. Uh, I think we broadly know where we get uh, emissions in the state of Washington. Many of you probably know that the trend, because of all the clean hydropower that we have, uh, the transportation sector is the predominant way that we uh, emit greenhouse gas emissions. And then uh, buildings play a large role in that process as well. So we brought in additional help. We brought in these 27, um, members of our advisory committee and we've embarked on this comprehensive data-driven and stakeholder supported process to reduce our emissions. This will be done through uh, December of this year uh, depending on how we um, organize our conversations with the stay home and stay safe order in place. And the idea is to think through the ways in which the state needs to adapt policy and program and infrastructure when we make some pretty significant changes to the built environment, both from a transportation perspective and from a building's perspective. So what we wanna do is electrify everything we can. Uh, the comment was made earlier about um, you know, transitioning away from the internal combustion engine to electric vehicles. 
that's something that the state energy strategy will take a really significant look at. Uh, we're also looking to do the same thing with buildings and try to electrify all the systems, heating systems, cooking systems, that sort of thing um, uh, along the way. And as we add all of that load to our electricity system and we stop, we use more renewable energy to meet that demand, uh, the technology that we have and um, the, the lack of real time visibility into how all those pieces are working together um, needs to be resolved so that we've got a better snapshot of how the grid and people and communities are interacting to keep the lights on all the time. So we expect to look at uh, changes that need to take place in the electricity sector, changes that need to take place in the industrial sector, changes that need to take place in transportation and agriculture and other areas, and develop some policy ideas to deal with some of those questions. We also wanna take a look at the differences between the clean energy transformation in urban settings and in rural settings. And we want to play, pay particular uh, attention to who benefits and who pays from this transition to make sure that uh, folks in our most vulnerable communities, communities of color, frontline communities have an opportunity uh, to have a say in the transformation process uh, and also to benefit from, from it, as it as it rolls forward. So this is a little bit of a teaser for where the state is headed and, uh, and we'll know more about how we're going to step through it at the next Earth Day. Thanks again. Thank you. That's excellent. Um, really great to hear. That's pretty inspiring. It would be hard to imagine that we were going to be in this situation five years ago uh, with all the work that the state's doing. So it's really remarkable that we put it on turbo and uh, making this stuff happen in a huge way. So thanks for all your good work. Um, now we're going to take it down to the next level with the, the local work, uh, local for um, North Central Washington for the Metau and Okanagan Valleys. And I'm going to hand it over to Amelia to talk about what's happening um, with the Colville tribe. Um, as introduced by Jasmine, my name is Amelia Marchand, <clears throat> and I serve as the program director for the Colville Confederated Tribes Environmental Trust Department. I'm Okanagan, Chief Joseph Band of Nez Perce, Moses Columbia, Palouse, and Arrow Lakes, a citizen of the Causal Confederated Tribes born and raised on the reservation. I'm so pleased to participate in this event and so thankful for the Metha Valley Citizens Council for organizing it. Thank you so much. Uh, with the time I have, I'll talk briefly about the tribes and the department I work with. Um, as recognized by our elder, Mark Miller, previously, indigenous peoples have been the caretakers of the lands and waters throughout this region for time immemorial. Our ancestors relied upon this diverse ecosystem for survival, sustenance, transportation, health, culture, economy, and community, just as we do today. Our cultural continuity, physical, and spiritual health is dependent upon access to and availability of a resilient and functioning ecosystem rich with diversity. Today, the reservation includes 1.4 million acres of land in northeastern Washington state, and it contains about 4,500 miles of waterways. Lands on the reservation include fee or private property, allotment, and trust land. Allotment properties are private lands owned in whole or part by individual tribal citizens and the tribal government, with management authority governed by the U.S. Department of Interior's Bureau of Indian Affairs, or BIA. Trust lands on the reservation were exclusively reserved for the use and enjoyment of tribal citizens in 1872, of which BIA also has management authority. 
So over 1 million acres of our reservation lands are held in trust by the BIA. Much of the tribe's traditional territories continue to be protected federal lands. Two national recreation areas, one of which is on the reservation, one national historic site, and portions of three national U.S. forests. Our tribal citizens retain hunting, fishing, and gathering rights on the former north half of the reservation for time immemorial, the majority of which are now known as the Colville National Forest. Four federal dams on or adjacent to the reservation are also present. Two BIA dams on the reservation one managed by the Army Corps of Engineers on the Columbia River at Bridgeport, Washington, and one managed by the United States Bureau of Reclamation at Cooley Dam, Washington. Based upon the inherent sovereignty and constitution of the tribes, several tribal laws regulating water use, water quality, hydraulic practices, aggregate use, and hazardous substances have been enacted by the tribal government. These laws, called codes, apply to surface and groundwaters within the reservation and are administered by the Environmental Trust Department. The US EPA has promulgated water quality standards for the reservation um, in the CFRs, and the tribes have treatment as a state authorization for sections 106, 303C, 319, and 401 of the Clean Water Act. The tribes is also designated as a reservation covered by the federal air rules for reservations and coordinates with EPA on the implementation of new federal air quality laws impacting us. Interests of the causal tribes in water and air quality, terrestrial and aquatic habitat, and cultural resources extend beyond the boundaries of the reservation throughout our traditional territories and usual and accustomed lands, and rely upon protections required by other tribal, state, federal, and international jurisdictions. For decades, the causal tribes have led the way in investigating industrial pollution in the upper Columbia River, specifically the section of the river between Grand Coulee Dam and the U.S. Canadian border, resulting with a significant lawsuit against Tech Cominco for their smelter activities in Trail, British Columbia. For decades, the causal confederated tribes have opposed mining on the reservation and within our traditional territories. This includes support of the litigation brought forth by the Okanagan Highland Alliance against the Buckhorn Gold Mine, which is located within the former North Half. I approach the work I and my co-workers are tasked with through the lens of climate change, food and water sovereignty, and environmental justice and protection. Our staff serves on intergovernmental and interdisciplinary teams for natural resource damage assessment and emergency response to wildfires, flooding, windstorms, and now this coronavirus pandemic. Throughout this work, we have coordinated with other tribal departments and the University of Washington Climate Impacts Group to develop a climate risk and vulnerability assessment. Um, I believe it was last spring I made contact with Jasmine, or she made me contact with me, and uh, we had completed the vulnerability assessment. And importantly with that assessment, it focused not just on the 1.4 million acres of our reservation, but throughout our traditional territories um, in Washington and even extending into our traditional territories in British Columbia and down into the Willow Valley of Oregon to an extent. And making sure that, that we're helping to fill gaps and collaborate on data and information sharing when it supports the values that 
we mutually have for environmental protection and clean environments is the best thing that we can do right now. Um, this past fall, the Kabul tribes also submitted a petition to the Department of Ecology for um, water rights to really address the overallocation of water resources within our territories, uh, specifically the Okanagan River, which originates in British Columbia. And as soon as you cross the border from BC down into Washington, you see a dramatic change. Yes, there is overallocation up on the BC side of the river, but down um, further south, more out of the Okanagan County region, there's significant overallocation of the Okanagan River and the Columbia River. Um, so we're hoping to, we have to take some significant broad steps to try and protect the environment that we all share, that we all are, are living in and responsible for. Right now, one of the things that we're also, I'm waiting on with my fingers crossed, um, we've applied for funding to do a climate adaptation plan for the Caldwell tribes. And that plan was, uh, again, another integrated attempt with the tribe's Fish and Wildlife Department as well as our public safety department. Um, anyone that lived in this region in 2015, and a lot of the youth that were on the video shared previously, understand what it means when there's a significant wildfire risk and threats to our communities. And unfortunately, it's not just it's terrible having to evacuate your home from a fire, which, which I have also done and my family members have as well. But one of the, the concerns that the tribes have had to address over and over is for a lot of the public utility districts in our region, um, some of our tribal communities are, the, are at the end of the line to get electrical um, services back up and running. And that's, that's something that we haven't just witnessed because of the wildfires, but something that we've also experienced because of the windstorms that we've had as well. In, I think it was in 2012, the San Poil Valley windstorm was, was devastating to the San Poil Valley, which is on the reservation and then extends up north into on the north half. Um, in communities between our reservation and the Canadian border. But that devastated the power grid in our area as well for, I want to say, over a week, definitely over a week. And a lot of our communities, we will hunt and fish and gather and preserve the food that we have so that we can so that when we have um, have to have ceremonies, whether it's a funeral ceremony or um, a, another type of gathering, that we have those traditional foods available, and the instability with our with our climate right now, it not just creates a lessening of the native plant species and the the habitats that they need, but it creates the instability for our infrastructure, our electrical grid, our water um, resource infrastructure, and our transportation infrastructure to get to those sites to be able to harvest and store and preserve our food. And that, that's a threat that um, that we're hoping to be able to address more with our climate adaptation plan if we get the funding. So <laughs> there's, there's a lot of different things um, that we're continuing to have to address as well. Um, one, of the, 
we have to address what's going on at the federal level, and we also have to address what's going on at the state level, and we have to address what's going on at the local level. So for a staff that has less than 20 people, it's a really big ask, um, and we're, we're constantly trying to prioritize and focus on where, where we can have the most impact what's going on in the federal register that we have to comment to. Um, what is the Department of Ecology going to do with water trust banking? What um, is going on in Okanagan or Ferry counties, or even down in Grant County, um, for, for things that impact not just the resources that we have, but the resources that we depend on. So it's a little bit about what's been going on, on and off the Culver Reservation. <laughs> that come is, a long way. <laughs> that is an incredible body of work, Amelia. We really are deeply grateful for the, that all that incredible work. And I just listening to you talk, it there's so much in common. There's so much we're on a parallel track, and I think these conversations are so important to bring our efforts together because there's so much common ground in terms of the goals that we're all trying to achieve. Clean air and abundant water and uh, getting our salmon runs back and, and we have so much in common. So I think these conversations are so important to tie our efforts a little more closely together. Um, I'm just gonna briefly, uh, I'm gonna bring up the other panelists and we're going to, um, here they are. They're there. Um, I'm just going to briefly, very briefly talk about what's happening in the Metau with our climate action plan and then I'm going to get to a few questions because we've had a few pop up. But um, for the last year, um, our community has uh, come together in this really powerful way to help define and create its own future. We've been, the last five years have been pretty tough with huge wildfires, big smoke events, People have lost homes. They've been evacuated several times. Um, things have been pretty intense. Um, and so coming to this coming together just happened uh, in the last year. And uh, Meadow Valley Citizens Council facilitated a watershed-wide climate task force. And it, it's from Mazama to Pateras. And it includes a pretty wide cross-section of stakeholders and interests from the Metau Valley. Um, it has representatives from business and nonprofits and government and community leaders. Um, and we've been meeting to really do two things to develop, to really understand how climate change is going to impact the Metau watershed and what do we need to do to be prepared for those changes. And to answer that question, um, like you, Amelia, we've been working with Dr. Amy Snover at the Climate Impacts Group, and she's really given us a foundation of science to build a plan around. Um, we held a large public workshop this last fall where we uh, heard from Dr. Snover and we identified as many of the potential impacts we could think of and we're in the process of taking all the feedback from the community on what are the biggest concerns um, and what do we really need to prioritize in terms of actions. Um, the next step of the climate action plan is going to be looking at our, our missions. And we've, we are working with uh, Rule Hammerschlag, who is, has done climate inventories for other counties. And he's working with us to do a climate emissions inventory for the Metau Valley. And that will give us as a community a better idea of what's our role in the, in the global effort to reduce our carbon emissions. Uh, where do we really need to put most of our energy to get our biggest bang for our buck. So where that's in process right now, we're gonna hold another workshop. Uh, we'll see what happens with the state home order. It might be through a Zoom webinar again, which, uh, you know, I think we've got a practice run here. Um, but our goal is really to have a final climate action plan with an emphasis on action by the end of this year. So we can hit the ground running um, in the state legislature and um, other efforts to really prioritize uh, resources to this community who's we've been so deeply impacted. We're on the front lines of climate change. And we've got a pretty 
incredible army of uh, youth activists as well who are behind us 100% and are, are with us um, helping make sure that we, that this climate action plan gets finalized and that the appropriate resources come to our, our, our rural area to help us make this transition. So that's what we've been up to over in the Metau. Um, I'd like to switch gears now. I've got a few questions. We've just, we're, we're a little bit over time. So I just wanna let the audience know that we're gonna go um, about uh, probably about five more minutes. And so we'd love for you to stay. Um, we're almost done. We've got a really powerful closing that I don't want anyone to miss. So hang in there. We're, we're close to being done, but I definitely wanted to get to these questions before we closed. Um, I'm just going to take a few. So apologies in advance if I didn't get to your question. Um, one is directed towards Professor Gerard. Um, how concerned are you about Trump's judicial appointments. It seems that these may cancel out some of the progress that he's described. Yeah, I'm very concerned about them. We now have uh, five to four um, majority of conservatives on the Supreme Court, and that endangers uh, the use of the Clean Air Act and other uh, laws to, uh, to fight climate change. Uh, we also have a large number of uh, Trump appointed judges at the courts of appeals and the district courts. Uh, most of the times when environmental rules are pro environmental rules are struck down is based on an ambiguity of the statute passed by Congress. So what we really need is a Congress that is going to pass good, clear environmental laws that the uh, judges have no choice but to uphold and enforce. Unmute myself here. Um, the next question is, I think for everybody, um, what skills do you think are, are most important for young people to have to get jobs in the green economy? So I'll, I'll take that. that working, that the, working in the Department of Commerce, we, um, we look at, at, at different ways to strengthen communities. Uh, and the green economy is a pretty slippery term, uh, as is clean tech, a space that we work in quite a bit. Um, I think that there's there's really room for everybody in this, as have uh, as your previous panelists have noted. Uh, there's roles to play within the bureaucracy using STEM sk uh, sil skills. There's roles to play in entrepreneurship. Uh, there are scientists that are tackling this, uh, and there are fierce advocates that are uh, pushing for stronger and stronger positions. Um, so I, I feel like finding your passion um, and then developing that is the best way to lean into that work. Great, thank you so much. Um, I just wanna take a moment to thank you all for joining us this afternoon and hearing about this really, really important work. I think there's a lot of people out there who are not aware of all this incredible behind the scenes work that's happening. So I think it was very, very important to have you here this afternoon to let people know that um, there are really smart, um, capable people on the front lines really trying to, to advance um, this vision of a green future for us. So thank you so much for your time and your energy and we really, really appreciate you. <laughs> Oh, you're muted, but thank you. Um, I'm gonna unmute you guys. Thanks, okay. thanks very much, Jasmine. Yes. Yeah, thanks Jasmine for the opportunity. Yeah, I look forward to connecting with you all again and staying in touch as our climate plan unfolds. Thank you. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. <laughs>
I get to welcome um, my friend, our friend. I think many people who are watching their friend as well, Medal Grown musician Luke Reno. Um, Luke is a musician, a producer, a humanitarian who lives by the code that anything is possible if we do not limit ourselves. And his life is an example of synchronistic successes resulting from following your heart and living a life that is open and trusting. And many of you probably know Luke from a song that he wrote back in 2005 called Freedom Song. Um, he wrote it um, right after Hurricane Katrina with a group of kids in a shelter. And um, in 2007, um, actually just soon after, uh, Grammy Award winning artist Jason Mraz covered that song on his album and it turned into an international success. Um, I'm just so honored, Luke, that you're here with us today. I know that you're in your LA studio, but you're, you're right here in the Medha with us. Um, you're, you're here in the Aspens with me. <laughs> and um, thank you so much. I know it's your mother's birthday today, so I want to say happy birthday to her. And I want to just welcome you. Everybody, yes. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Can, can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, yes, and um, what a wonderful um program you all have put together, and uh, just very touched by all the speakers that spoke before and the passion and the heart and the time and the actions. And I love your organizations. I love Matt Howe Arts and I love the Matt Howe Valley Citizens Council. And I miss my home just looking at the trees behind you. I know that's a picture from near your home and right there in the Matt Howe Valley. And uh, I miss my home so much. You made it sound really glamorous like I'm in LA or something. I'm yeah, I'm close to LA. I'm in Topanga. So I got a little bit of the mountains. Um, but yeah, I, um, I thought about this song um, in a closing. Um, and it, it's kind of a new song uh, called Let Us Dream. And I thought about this song from the standpoint that we as humans have this great potential to to dream and when when i say dream when i think of dream is also to imagine and create uh we can create and we can do so much and um and just like the speakers that spoke before and everybody in this program that are spending their time creating um taking action and um you know, to, to, to better the earth, to uh, be stewards of the earth. And um, I also think of this time in this pandemic that to dream, the ability to dream of a, of a new way, of a new way. And um, almost like from caterpillar to butterfly, like how can we evolve in a new way? And like your great video earlier showed, you know, so we don't get booted off. How do we engage with this wonderful planet that we get to live on? And um, uh, on that, I'm going to get straight to the song because there's been a lot of great speaking. Oh, just got a little out of tune. Hold on. There we go. Much better. Didn't want to play a song out of tune. I was like this. Tell me, Lord, I need to sing. Ever since I was little, I was prone to dream. Was there too much space between my head and my feet? Cause I had a little trouble keeping track of things. Where's your jacket? My dad would ask. 
I said, Dad, I don't know where I had it last. I'll get it back. Don't be mad, Dad. Let us dream, let us fly so high. Take those knots that made us cry. We untie them. Well, nowadays there's no balance in me. I've grown roots and wings simultaneously. I really feel I've made big strides to keep my feet on the ground while flying my kite. But sometimes people like their memory of you, yeah. Yet you can't live there cause you're blazing brand new. Let us dream, let us fly so high. Yeah. Take those knots that made us cry. Your time then. Your time She picks herself up off of the floor Every little movement is the greatest chore Tries not to give up as she searches the drawers For the pen and paper she's looking for writes this message mm. hangs it up on the back of a bedroom door yeah. every day when she goes out the sound of a voice reading it it helps her out yeah. and it says i will not be afraid Take the steps I must today. Help me be brave to face the ones I must today. I will not be afraid to take the steps I must today. Help me be brave to take the ones I must today. Yeah. All right, everybody sing. Say, let us dream, let us fly so high. Mm -hmm. Take those knots that made us cry. We are Everybody can't hear you. Come on. Let us dream. Let us fly. So high. Take those knots that made us cry. We are tired. We're aligned. Thank you. Wow. I'm singing. Thank you so much, Luke. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Yeah, that was beautiful. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Let us dream. We need to dream and not be afraid. Thank you. That, I think I'm going to be listening to that song several times this week. I think it's so important for us to envision the future that the young people uh, are holding in their hearts and to be inspired by, by 
the incredible people like Shutescott and our panelists who fight for that vision and the, the important message from Dennis Hayes that there's so much work to be done here locally. And the Metau Valley is abundant with really incredible community-minded nonprofit organizations, uh, businesses, students, individuals. And so we thank you for supporting these groups right now in the best way that you can, because we all together can make this change possible. Thank you for being here tonight. I'm gonna to hand it over to Amanda to close us out. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jasmine. And um, I think for ideas about ways that you can take part, both the Meta Valley Citizens Council and MetaHow Arts, um, we'll have action pages that you can see now that will offer a lot of different details and ways that you can be involved. Um, MetaHow Arts is open you know, Monday through Friday right now, remotely. Um, we'd love to hear your ideas. Um, also, Give Big is opening. It's already open and it will be um, available through May 5th. If you'd like to contribute to a local cause, another organization, there's so many beautiful organizations that are doing good work right now. We're all in this together. Um, and I personally, I want to invite all of you, um, before I welcome our last speaker, I want to invite all of you to welcome your feelings um, and to express yourselves. I invite you to take action and share your ideas. You can tag us on Facebook and Instagram, both the Meta Valley Citizens Council and MetHow Arts. Um, we'll share it. You know, we would love to hear what you're thinking and what you're creating through art. Art is a powerful tool for all of this. So let us dream and let us fly. Um, and with that, I'd like to um, introduce um, the last person who will be closing this beautiful ceremony tonight, and that is one of my friends, Washington State Poet Laureate, Claudia Castro Luna, who um, has worked in the Okanagan County extensively across the schools with her poetry and with students also offering um, workshops, poetry workshops that have allowed several of you to engage. Claudia served as a Seattle civic poet from 2015 to 2017. She's won so many awards, I cannot possibly mention them all. Um, and she's currently working on a memoir, Like Water to Drink, about her experience escaping the Civil War in her homeland before she came here, El Salvador. Living in English and Spanish, Claudia writes and teaches in Seattle where she gardens and she keeps chickens with her husband and her three children. A welcome, Claudia. Hello, everyone. This is Claudia Castro Luna, Washington State's Poet Laureate, tuning in from Seattle. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this momentous celebration the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. To do that, I wanted to share a section of a longer poem I wrote inspired by and in honor of the Columbia River, of which your Twist River is a tributary. Um, so he here we go. One River, a Thousand Voices, an excerpt. Before all the befores, you, River, had already been called a thousand and one names, each name for every animal, creature, and vegetable spirit that ever breathed, mated, and died, that ever flowered or shed a spore, each tree, each flower, each bulb, fish, mammal, insect, bird, each calling you a name of her own, each thing indebted to your grace, all the flora, all the fauna, calling to you in dreams of awakening and in sobering dreams of change and demise, each name in every dimension perfect, iridescent as the miracle of a fish scale, fragile as dragonfly's wings, a stooly reed sturdy and resilient as bitter root. 
each creature, her features and body and her own melodious name for life, the owl who swoops to snatch in night's downy hush the unsuspecting frog, trout whose rainbow swagger flares gainfully your waters as we call out to them, they call out to you each living thing with her own ardent name on the hoof on the scale on the feather on the fur on the leaf on the mud on the beak on the bark one river a thousand names a thousand voices chanting river songs singing songs of place charting songs of belonging thank you Thank you for taking the time to celebrate our interconnectedness to each other and to our earth. Take care.